I welcome each and every one of you to my book launch today, Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster. The book starts with my entry to Parliament when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister and takes us right through today and the present Prime Minister. It reflects on the sort of parliamentarians I've met over that period, the trials and tribulations that Parliament has, dare I say, endured during that period. It reflects on the change of practices and the way various traditions have altered. And it also gives commentary on today's Members of Parliament. I hope you enjoy reading it. And now, the journalist and presenter, Andrew Pearce, will interview me about the book. So he's been a Member of Parliament since 1983. He's a senior Conservative backbencher. His name is Sir David Amos. He's written a fascinating new book about his experiences at Parliament called Eyes and Ears. And I'm with him now. Sir David, I'm going to call you Sir David to give you your full <laughs> moniker. Um, you won in 1983 in the great Thatcher landslide. You and I were great admirers of Mrs Thatcher. Um, have you seen anybody even approaching Margaret Thatcher in terms of leadership ability since then? Andrew, you're rightly putting me in a difficult position because of all those who followed her are still alive. But without question, um, Margaret Thatcher is the finest politician, prime minister that I've ever worked with. And uh, I'm afraid if when you're first elected, you're there with the best leader, uh, then everything else sort of mildly is slightly disappointing. I mean, all, all successive prime ministers had their strong weak points, but none really of the caliber of Margaret Thatcher because she changed our country and she changed the world and made them better places. And one of the things that she did, David, which I always admired about her, she stuck to her guns. And I think there are some prime ministers, no names mentioned here, who simply don't. Yeah, I mean, Margaret, uh, this extraordinary woman, she didn't just chase popularity, she told people what she believed in, set out the policy, and she fought for it. Whereas uh, the modern way seems to be that a policy is announced, which you would hope whoever's putting forward the policy really believes in it, and they would fight for it. But you just get, well, few turns. And as she famously said at that party conference, you turn if you want to, but this lady is not returning, and she never did. Exactly. So when you came in in 1983, David, I've looked at your book and you said that you, you admit yourself, you were almost in awe of Parliament as an institution, almost in awe of elected members of Parliament. And that's a good thing, I think. But now you've been elected for a ninth time. You don't see it that way. No. How do you, I, I, how I do you see it now? Well, I, I, I had huge respect because, look, I'm a very humble background and uh, someone like me, the idea that you could become a member of parliament, wow, it just wasn't possible, let alone a conservative member of parliament. And uh, it was just because I had spent, although I was young, I'd spent a lot of time working my way through the party since uh, the age of 16, when I got there eventually, um, it, it, it was an overwhelming experience of joy. But there I would be on those green benches with giants of parliament. And fast forwarding it nearly 40 years now, whereas if you like, I was in awe of people and knew my place, uh, I no longer feel like that at all. Um, I, it just, just doesn't seem that I'm, that there are so many what I regard as really special anymore. And to be fair with them, times have changed dramatically. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have the way of communicating that we did now, but certainly uh, parliamentarians have changed an awful lot from when I was first elected. Well, what are the other changes that you've seen? So for instance, last week, uh, Sir David, I had dinner with a member of the House of Lords. He voted in a restaurant just before lockdown on his computer. <laughs> Needless to say, I won't say who he was, 
He yeah. didn't know what he was voting for, but he was told which way to vote. But that shows the House of Lords is getting with it. But do you think it's regrettable now that that can happen? That you can't, that you should, do you think you should vote in person? Something you talk about in your book, I know. Well, I personally do, and this is ironic. I sat at my desk last night waiting to vote, and I said to my whip, look, am I the mug? I've just been down the corridor, I'm the only person here. And he messaged me back and said, David, well, that's because they've all got proxy votes. So, you know, I'm, I'm old school, as it turned out, there weren't any votes. But the reason we vote in person was going through the lobbies, you meet colleagues, you meet the Prime Minister, you meet the Chancellor, the Exchequer, and you'd say, please, I need help. Why did you make that decision? And it was a way of meeting. And all this remote voting, I think, is absolutely ridiculous. This is the mother of parliaments, and there is absolutely no substitute, as far as I'm concerned, than physical contact with your colleagues. And that is the way you get things done, and that's the way, as far as I'm concerned, you make history for the good. Um, you talk in the book about some great scandals that have taken place while you've been there, David. Tell me the ones that you've, uh, the ones you, perhaps the ones that, there's some scandals you probably haven't written about because you might get sued, particularly if they involve me. But there, there'll be some scandals you have written about in the book, which you can tell me about. The biggest scandal, as far as I'm concerned, is that a prime minister went to the dispatch box, told the House of Commons that there were weapons of mass destruction that could reach this country within a short space of time. And if we didn't vote, to go to war and join the Americans, then we'd all be done for. And Andrew, I will never forgive myself until my dying day that having arrived in the chamber and I wasn't gonna vote for it, I thought, well, the prime minister must be telling the truth. I went along with it. And what happened, we got terrorism into this country far more quickly than would otherwise have been the case. And that is why a number of years later, when I was asked by um, another prime minister to vote in favour of conflict, I didn't. I didn't want to make the same mistake again, but people could argue about that. So I think really that's probably about the biggest scandal, but there are so many scandals. Uh, I, I, I could just go on and on about them. And this book, by the way, is just a taster. Yeah, because you've had, I mean, in 37 years, what would you say, David Amos, is the, the change for the best that you've seen, that you welcome, and then possibly, because you don't just want to dwell on negatives, but there will be a negative. What's the, the negative? Um, and I'm thinking perhaps perception of MPs because of the 2009 expenses scandal. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, the, the, the changes for, for the better I mean, as far as the constituency is concerned, uh, I suppose um, it was when we opened a hospice from absolutely nothing. We set up a horse and pony, donkey sat sanctuary, stuff like that. But when on the 18th attempt, I came out high up in the private members ballot, uh, I piloted the Warm Homes and Energy Conservation Bill, which became an act of parliament. Um, against, I'm not going to name them because one is still in the House of Lords, the other person is deceased, two colleagues who I like very much, but they tried to sabotage the bill and it was a year of warfare, frankly, parliamentary warfare, and eventually I got the bill onto the uh, statute. And as far as the biggest negative thing is concerned, I think it's a dumbed down of Parliament. And this all started, I, I am going to be political now, from 1997 to 2010, when uh, unelected quangos really took over. So when I was first elected, I was very confident we parliamentarians had 100% of the power, and then gradually it ebbed away. And that was absolutely compounded with our membership of the European Union. So yes, Andrew, I am celebrating the 52-48 result. And from the 1st of January, I think we have a new dawn and a very bright future. Interesting as well, because um, we won't want to date this, but um, Sir John Major has said 
only today that Britain is now going to be a second rate nation, which I think is a bit rich considering he was a second rate prime minister because we've left the European Union, because we're leaving the European Union. But you were a Brexiteer, David Re Amos. You're proud to be a Brexiteer. And I know you said to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in that election campaign, it was a referendum, it was a, almost another referendum. He had to get Brexit done. Yeah, and I mean, that is why I voted for Boris. Uh, I mean, I'd, I, I didn't vote for Boris to lead us in the pandemic or, or any candidate, really. It was because we had a choice of two people and he was uh, a proper Brexiteer. And I'm of the age where I voted in the previous referendum, when we lost by huge numbers. And I accepted that uh, result rather reluctantly. And then when I became a member of parliament, I saw bit by bit our power being taken away. Andrew, I never thought we'd get an opportunity to vote again. And uh, although it went wrong for the then Prime Minister and his Chancellor, I take my hat off to them that they did give us the opportunity. I did not expect the result of the referendum to go the way it did, considering that the whole of the government machinery was for uh, the result to mean that we would stay in the European Union. I was staggered by the result and um, Far from seeing that we're going to become a second-rate country, I think the complete reverse will happen. And I also think that those members who remain in the European Union, although they've made it as difficult as they possibly can for us to leave, I think they're going to be envious. We've got a great future. And um, do you think also, by leaving the European Union, the parliament that you loved, but where, where, where you've seen power diminished, that power will flow back, sovereignty will flow back to Parliament. That is precisely what I will believe will happen. I mean, for goodness sake, the fisheries policy, the agriculture policy. You know, half the time we, we were making laws, this country was sickened to them, and not all of our European partners would, would do it. it. It's been absolutely farcical over the years. And because I help chair things now, I could see how our power is slipping away. But because, um, I mean, probably in the future, you may not have members of parliament serving as long as I have. It seems to be that they're members for a much shorter period. So I am able to judge how it's all changed. And I, I think that when we leave the European Union, it means that when you go to vote for your member of parliament, and we all know the turnout was very, very low for European members of parliament, and no one really knew who they were. But when you go to vote for your member of parliament, my goodness, it's really going to count. They will be able to make a real difference for you and your family and for our country. So yes, we are going to take back control and I welcome it. And um, what about your friends you've made in Parliament over the years, Sir David Amos? You've been there a long time. You've seen people come and go. For instance, I know you're very close to the saintly Anne Widdicombe, the star of stage and screen. <laughs> Um, who we love to see in Panto, uh, and you've got other great friends. Um, I mean, in my in my life, I've only got we we just have a handful of very close friends. But who are the great friends you've made over the years? Well, Andrew, I so agree with you because you well, 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 when you're in a spot of bother, you know who your friends are, and you can really count them on your hands. Well, before the SDP uh, in Parliament, we used to be known as the Gang of Four. And the four of us would sit in the pugin room, something that doesn't happen now. The tea room doesn't operate as, as it did. And it used to be Dear Anne, David, now Lord Alton. Oh, and, yes. And uh, my late friend, Ken Hargreaves, who was a member of uh, Einburn. The four of us would sit there, share good company, and sort of gossip about things which are happening. Uh, so I have, over the years, made some very, very good friends. The thing I would point out to you though now, Andrew, I mean, we've just had, um, I think it's, well, it's, it's over 80 new members of parliament elected for the conservative benches. And each parliament, there are less people that I know really well. Uh, so from my intake, all that remains are now two other colleagues I'm talking about with uh, continual service. 
So the friendships do diminish. But where I am in Essex, I have got some uh, good close friends. And um, yeah, I, 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 I value the, those uh, friendships. Who are, the, who are the other two from the 83 intake? I can't remember. Who would they be? Uh, they, the, the, the two with continual service are Roger Gale and Edward. Oh, yes. So oh, yes. It, it yeah. is three of us. So um, in seniority, in terms of length of service, Peter Bottomley is number one. Edward is number two, because he was queuing ahead of me. I'm number three, and Roger is number four. And if you take the Labour benches, I'm number seven on the uh, list. But to get back to um, Anne, I do very much miss her. Uh, I understand why she left when she did. She certainly should have gone to the House of Lords, but uh, no, no one will replace Ken and Anne, I've still got David as a friend, but I have found a few other colleagues who I'm very friendly with. Exactly. Now, people will ask how many more years you'll do, David Amos, and <laughs> even if you do decide to stand down next time, there's a place, it's called The Other Place, with the red leather benches. Can you see yourself in the House of Lords? Lord Amos of Essex. <laughs> it's got quite a nice ring to it. <laughs> Now, uh, Andrew, I never make predictions. Uh, right. Like at every election, I've never taken anything for granted. I never make predictions. Um, I, and I keep saying, I want to remain a, an MP because of this, that. And here I am now in a pandemic when I go to vote and we're all wearing face masks. So I have been here uh, through remarkable times, but there's no point my being here unless I'm doing something, and I'm a person who wants to do something to improve the situation for the constituents and make some sort of small contribution to, to the country. Now, just finally, because we're running out of time, David, your book is called Eyes, A-Y-E-S, Eyes and Ears. I think I know why you've called it that. Tell, tell us why you've called it that, but why you've called it that. Well, it's seeing things, listening to things, and it was a sort of take on uh, voting as, 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 as well. Um, and the survivor's guide is, and I think new colleagues are realizing, in fact, one of my children said to me the other day, Dad, because unfortunately they read a bit of abuse online, how, how have you put up with it for so long? Well, I, I was much more thin skinned than I am now really. I still am moved by things, but you do become hardened to it all. But to actually survive, and you did mention all the scandals, it, it's been pr pretty tough. But look, many books have been written about Parliament. This is just a take on the way I see it. And these four decades have undoubtedly uh, been quite remarkable. And I didn't want to bring the book out, Andrew, until it was too late. And I think now, as we leave the European Union and we cope with pandemic, I think we've got the time just about right. I think you have. So that's it. The book is called Eyes and Ears, Survivor's Guide to Westminster, written by the very own Sir David Amos. By the way, what is your majority now? How big is it now? It, it's nearly 15,000, just yeah. under 15. And there, there I was in the Basildon days um, with a very small book majority, absolutely unbelievable. And did I think that I would replace the Guinness family after a hundred years? No way. Oh, because you were supposed, did you replace Paul Channon? Yeah, yeah. Did you? So it, was Paul, it started off as Lord and Lady Ivor, his grandparents, then it was Chip Channon's with his wonderful diaries. Then it was Paul Channon for, uh, I think he did 38 years at the end. And now it's David Amos, from this little terrace house in the east end of London, where we didn't even have a bathroom, but a tin bar. And I'm a conservative who believes that every person should be given the opportunity to make the most of their lives. And it's worked for me, and I want it to work for others. And I hope that I will be able to encourage uh, gentlemen and ladies to also pursue a career in politics so that we can continue to rebuild our great country once we leave the European Union.
here. Yeah. Dave, Sir David Amos, his book is called, just to remind you, Eyes and Ears, Survivor's Guide to Westminster. And boy, has he survived. If anyone has any questions they would like to ask me, if they post it in the live chat section in the comments column, I'd be pleased to answer those questions. And after that period, we'll close the launch with the trailer about the book. And just to emphasize again, uh, you can purchase the book from all good bookstores and from Amazon. And the profits go to three charities, which are certainly important to me. That's the Music Man Project, Prostate and Endometriosis UK. And thank you for attending this launch. This is my journey so far, where I was born, where I became a councillor, when I was first elected to Parliament, and where I am now the Member of Parliament for. Enjoy my journey.
I hope you enjoy reading my book, Eyes and Ears, A Survivor's Guide to Westminster.